a mix really on on the basis of a long term vision for reform and transformation that we're excited about in the northwest and having managed our way through as everybody has in the the world really the most the most strange and challenging year and, and a bit of a mix of of, of two bits of analysis that I think reaffirm in the main um, our starting point. So, so can you move the slide on, Leah, and I'll try and get into the, the setup. And it's just a little bit about us as a branch. So on the right hand side, you can see a schematic photograph with Cumbria at the top in red and, and then Lancashire and then moving down into the Greater Manchester, Liverpool, city regions and down to Cheshire's and, and Warrington. And, and you'll see there basically 23 local authorities, the mix of counties um, with districts, unitary, um, rural and urban. So we've got a bit of everything and, and 7.3 million residents in the northwest of England. And those two photos are, aren't as old as they look, but you'll see no, fo no social distancing in either. Um, I suppose, like I'd say in the branch, in, in, we've been a great branch, I think, for working collaboratively to support each other ever since I've been involved in it. And that's been a good few years. And I think in more recent years, we've done some really um, important work on, on markets and trying to understand resilience and risks in markets. And, and similarly, in workforce and, and maybe looking at some of that from the point of view of obvious deficits and risks to the sector. Um, but I think we were also probably waiting not so naively for um, kind of trumpeted green papers or white papers on the long term reform of adult social care. And we're getting a bit sick of waiting. And, and in January 2020, that photo on the top left is in Stockport Town Hall. And it was very much the beginning of what we're going to talk to you about, a, a kind of vision for, for 2030 and the care models that we believe residents deserve. It was very much developed, um, you know, with, with users with lived experience, with TLAP helping us out. And there was a sense that we wanted something to strive for with, you know, care built around people's wishes, people's best days. Um, you'll, you'll hear every day the best it can be and that kind of phrase, but thinking about people having the best life in the local community where possible, the centrality of things like housing and digital um, to new models of care and starting to really think about uh, new models alongside markets and workforce as three pillars of reform work. And, and actually the, the, the photo below was us receiving the first outputs of that. It's the last time the Northwest Branch Executive ever got together um, in person. It was February 2020. And if you've really eagle-eyed, you'd see Julie Oakley and Kathy Williams on that picture who uh, visit each region in, in each year. And Kath, uh, Julie was coming towards the end of uh, the President's year and was interested to hear about the work we were doing. So it's sort of really exciting time and, and we hadn't been thinking that global pandemics were anything much more. I know that the, the first signs of COVID have been being reported on the news, but it was more probably the, the realms of fiction films and things that we would deal with in day to day jobs. The next slide, please. This is where Steph's going to uh, tell me off because every single picture on here is from Wigan Council, not from any of the others in the Northwest. But I know that we all went through and are going through something that 152 councils have had to face with social services responsibilities. And like just speaking from the, the point of view of Wigan, the sort of pride in the flexibility of the response and the amazing things we did in hugely sort of difficult times was, is something that still sort of surprises me and makes me feel proud. And um, just for context for us, uh, Wigan Council's got 4,000 employees, but 900 of those ended up leaving jobs they used to do and helping out in other areas of critical need. And for us in adult social care, we were a huge customer of that. We weren't, weren't just a customer in terms of people like leaving the leisure centres and helping us out with some, say, lower level, you know, tasks in some of our frontline prevention services for adult social care. We were also reaching into the most stricken parts of the sector, for example, privately run care homes and helping out not just with things like PPE and financing, but actually staff on the ground, you know, getting the uh, 
in there and helping out. And uh, as I say, you know, the whole country and the world has been through something like this, but there was a sense that um, our 10 year vision was rocked by the reactive and crisis nature of the, the work we were doing. And certainly within the Northwest branch and within the sub regions uh, components thereof, there was a massive kind of um, support resource that we worked with together um, to share our way through you know, the first few months and beyond of that experience. But we also within the branch wanted to kind of learn, particularly as we were coming out of wave one of the experience into what were the rapid innovations and lessons we'd learned either within the sector or in local systems that we wanted to keep hold of. Um, Matt's going to talk you through that in a minute, but the, the last slide that I'm going to speak to just before passing to Matt is, is a schematic from a piece of work that Matt's going to describe that we commissioned as a branch. You won't be able to see it very clearly, or the, but if I explain to you, it's almost a, a month by month um, on the horizontal axis from January 2020 through to October 2020. And you'll see some very kind of um, a big graph of activity between March, April, May and June. And this is almost like daily what was emerging from central government in terms of rules or um, you know approaches that local systems needed to make sense of react to make the best of and it, I think it just shows you this almost the, the chaos we were working within to an extent but also um, some of the interesting parts of that are where we rapidly innovated with health partners or together things that we've probably been hoping to do for months and years and trying to get the best sense of what were we um, experiencing and what was the sustainable and system learning that we would want ourselves, NHS partners, communities, our, our local councils to understand and to adopt was something that um, was the reason we did this work really and what Matt's going to talk you through but I think it just shows you um, we were working on the watch rather than the calendar it felt like on given weeks and months and, and the resilience of frontline teams ourselves to do the work has, has been amazing but I think took its toll on on everybody so it's just important to say that in the, the setup. Um, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to um, pass you on to Matt, who's going to talk you through a couple of key pieces of work during COVID that um, we tried to sort of pull together to make sure there was more sustainable learning than just the, the crisis reaction. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Matt, the uh, Programme Director at Northwest ADAS. I'm um, going to tell you about two pieces of work that we um, we commissioned um, last year, looking at the lessons learned from the, the first wave of the pandemic. Um, so we, we commissioned these pieces of work um, to really kind of understand, you know, what, what lessons we could learn for dealing with any kind of future waves, but also what we could learn in terms of the, the longer term uh, transformation that we wanted to, um, to do in, in, in the region. Um, so the first the first piece there, the Northwest uh, Lessons Learned Review, that was primarily looking at um, the council and system response to the first wave. Um, and what we really wanted to do was not just look at <clears throat> what happened during that time, but also why it happened. And um, I suppose more importantly, what that meant then for um, the health and care system um, in the future. So with that piece of work, um, it lasted for five months. We spoke to over um, 300 um, stakeholders in the Northwest. Did over 250 hours of, of interviews and um, focus groups. So it's a, it's a fairly um, weighty piece of research. The second one listed there is the Northwest Elected Member Commission. Um, so this commission investigated the impact on people with care and support needs, their families, carers and communities. Um, and essentially what we did with this, um, we, we created something similar to um, a par parliamentary select committee. So um, we had um, a panel of um, elected members who hold the portfolio for health, health and care. Um, and um, we, um, we sent out a, a request for evidence and we had over a hundred um, stories sent back to us from people in the, in the Northwest telling us their story. Uh, and we listened to some of those stories in, in, in um, over three uh, listening, virtual listening sessions that we held with, with, with the panel. Okay, next slide please there. Thank you. So um, the, the research essentially um, found that there was um, a number of unique conditions that were um, created 
Um, some of these will look familiar to you um, and maybe of, of no surprise. Um, I'll just go through them um, uh, one by one. So um, the first one, money. So money can often be the barrier um, to um, delivering change at pace. Um, but what we found, um, um, and, that, and that's, that's often to do with where it sits or perhaps um, lack, lack of money. Um, but what the pandemic brought was guidance um, in relation to things like deferred charging, um, discharges, but also additional money. And both of these things together um, removed, removed barriers to make things um, happen. But secondly, focus. Um, so um, you're probably um, really aware that we all have a, a raft of, um, of different strategies, plans um, and objectives. But what the, uh, what the pandemic did was simplify this. And it gave us all um, a singular focus. Uh, what, what many people um, spoke to us about was having, um, and they use this language, about having a, a common enemy. And this um, extended you know, beyond just councils and the NHS saying this, but also uh, community and voluntary organizations, um, local businesses and communities um, using the same kind of language, you know, that, that singular focus. Thirdly, urgency. Um, uh, the, you know, we, we, we have um, a raft of governance. Um, we, we are quite risk averse sometimes, and this can really stifle um, the, the pace of transformation and innovation. But what people were told us was that actually this sense of urgency gave, gave us a permission, gave them a permission to, to respond um, quickly and decisively. Um, time. So um, uh, one of the things that people were saying that you know before the pandemic they they have a day job and then um, the kind of the, the program of transformation was something that sat um, to one side and often um, it's the, the latter suffered because of their lack of capacity to actually work on it. Um, but during the during the pandemic, um, a lot of those day to day activities stopped um, um, largely, um, and people were asking the question, you know, what what's important. Um, how can things be done differently? And so a lot of those kind of wasteful activities um, stopped um, and hopefully um, they, won't be, um, uh, they won't be coming back. And then finally, um, positive risk taking. Um, and again, people told us about um, sort of before the pandemic, um, some of their behaviours were characterised by, by a, a risk aversion, uh, by a fear of doing the wrong thing. But during the pandemic, um, people reported you know, much greater levels of empowerment to make decisions, um, to do the right thing for people. And this sort of emerging um, leadership style, which is much more facilitative um, and trusting of people to go away and do the right thing. Uh, next slide, please. And so <clears throat> these unique conditions, um, what we found was that they, they, they um, um, helped uh, to, uh, prior, priorities to converge, um, so uh, an alignment of priorities of organisations and of people. So where previously organisations collaborated on a, on a pretty small area of commonality, um, there was much greater alignment um, as, as organisations and people coalesced around this, um, this common enemy. And I think what's important about this, this diagram here is that is, uh, on the, on the right-hand side, the appearance of communities and communities were brought much more um, in line with those um, statutory um, organisations um, with the realisation that actually the help of um, volunteers, of friends, of relatives, uh, local businesses and community groups. Um, and I think there's a really important lesson here about you know, how, how, you know, the, how we involve communities in, in the work that we do. Uh, next slide, please, there. And so um, we, we, through the, um, the uh, executive member commission, we looked at the impact on people. Um, and obviously during the pandemic, um, communities were really vital in supporting people to stay safe and well, uh, living at home, you know, and, and protecting, you know, the, 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 sort of the NHS services and other services such as care homes. And when we, when we, when we spoke to people, we heard the stories and there was sort of two kind of real overriding issues that came out. And one was around unpaid carers. So uh, the number of unpaid carers really um, increased um, during the pandemic as people um, opted to um, care for relatives at home rather than going to a care home or having, having other, other kind of care services. And we've seen a corresponding drop in, in some of those, uh, in the occupancy of some of those services, which may, which may never um, go back to pre-pandemic levels. But what we heard from when we speak to people is this kind of this new generation of unpaid carers who perhaps hadn't um, considered themselves in, in that role, um, certainly at this time of their lives. So many of them 
still working full-time jobs um, with children, but also caring for perhaps um, um, elderly relatives as well. And so they they were they were describing describing this describing some of the the issues that they faced, but there was a real kind of concern around their their health and well-being and being able to continue to do that uh, going forward. Which brings us on, on to the next point around mental health. So um, this was probably by far the the um, the the biggest overriding issue really um, in, in what we heard from people. Um, so this wasn't just people um, who have care and support needs, but this was this was families, this was carers. Um, this, these were people who, who are paid carers working in care homes, for example. We heard, we heard many stories where the same theme of the impact of, of either working in a, in, a, in a care home and all the trauma that that's, that's, that's given, or just the impact of lockdown and how that's impacted on people's um, mental health. If you can move to the long sl next slide, please, Leah. And this is a quote from a family member who shared their story, um, and I think it really demonstrates the the impact. Um, so this this was just one story, um, and you can see, you know, uh, this person having to choose between whether they had contact with um, one of their two children in separate supported living, or their elderly parents. Um, and you, you can you can imagine the um, the, um, the emotional and um, mental impact on on people in in that situation. I think really shows you know, how you know and the, these these issues aren't going to be resolved just when the pandemic finishes. I think that's something that we need to be really aware of that these will these will continue. Um, next slide, please. And um, providers really did find new ways of 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 meeting people's needs and supporting people. And um, one of the things that came out of the stories was um, that personalization was um, people had different uh, kind of experiences of of, of their services. So for some, that sense of personalization was lost. Um, so things like um, care home visiting, it's been well publicized in terms of the impact on people's quality of life in care homes. Um, but, but actually for some people, um, their, their, um, the personalization was, was really enhanced by, by some of the kind of the changes to services. So in particular, when we heard from people with a learning disability about how they access more services through, through, through digital, and um, they were saying, actually, you know, this really suits the way that I, 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 I live my life um, and really, really, you know, um, actually is much more um, flexible for, for, for me as a person. And I think providers really benefited from a much more flexible way of working with commissioners. So, um, again, they were they were telling us that they were given permission by commissioners to do things differently, to make sure people's needs were met in the best way possible. So they really did innovate and they really did um, um, change the way that they, they did things. And I think what's emerged from that, um, and we, we, we're seeing now, is is this this real blended approach between digital and and reality, um, where you know people are accessing you know services in a much more flexible, and I think for some a lot more um, desirable way. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a quote from one of our providers um, who um, who did just that. They 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 um, adapted their service. They went completely online, um, and they provided um, a, a lot of comfort to people um, in terms of their mental and physical health, um, and really did help to reduce that kind of loneliness. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So finally, um, these are our um, our. Our lessons learned. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but um, I'll just pick on some of the, some of the main ones. Um, so third, the, the third one on, on there in terms of the market is responsive and resilient. Um, this was absolutely um, true. Um, that our providers really stepped up. Um, you know, given the the amount of risk and the pressures that they were under, they they really stepped up and they um, did um, some really really great work with people. We we changed the dialogue. I think with 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 um, providers, um, relationships really um, Im improved, and uh, we, you know, councils put a lot of trust in providers to do things differently. And I think you know in terms of a lesson, um, we need to take that forward because we must we must involve providers in in in, in designing new new models of care. Um, they 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 really know um, you know their their areas well, um, and you know, we need to make sure that we build those relationships um, and 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 trust them to to work with us on that. Uh, number five on there is people power change and the power of communities to deliver solutions. Again, as I said, um, communities really did um, step up and support people. Um, they really did, um, you know, en en enable people to live um, well at home, um, living, you know, you know, as happy as, as possible, given given the circumstances. Um, and, I, and I think what it, what it showed is that um, these 
you know, organizations and people, they, they can do this if, if, the, if the right conditions are there to, to allow it. Um, and so, you know, we, we must take that, take that with us going forward in terms of how we actually um, support and develop communities to um, deliver more um, support in the community. Um, number nine on there, social care workers are people too. And I think one of the, um, you know, it's, it's shone a massive um, spotlight on, on, on the care workforce um, and, the, and the work that they do. Um, I think um, there's, there's still lots more to make sure that that is actually followed through, um, you know, following that. And we, 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 we want to see, um, you know, parity with, with NHS workers on, on with, you know, with, the, with the social care workforce. Um, the one thing we've done in the Northwest is we've, we've now included unpaid carers within our workforce um, plan. Um, recognizing the importance of, 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 of that role. So um, I think that's an important step for us. And then finally, just to finish, um, the first, the top one there, number one, uh, for integration to succeed, systems need a common sense of purpose, which extends beyond COVID-19. And I think this is really um, uh, resonant now, um, given the, the sort of the changes in, in um, health and care architecture that's that are coming down the line. You know, we, we do need that common sense of purpose. We do need that common enemy, uh, to use that language, uh, to really kind of focus um, the, the, the minds on, on, on what we prioritise really across health and care. I'll, um, I'll stop there. How about to Stuart? Thanks, Matt. Thanks for taking us through that. And I think it was a good place to leave it to come back to where we were, because I think where in that Stockport Town Hall thing, we were kind of saying, you know, hope is is something um, stronger even than a com common enemy. And as kind of progressive plan for transformation was the thing that we were reaching for in terms of visions and models for adult social care that we could relate to for ourselves, for our loved ones and for how society is changing. And um, we did some work that um, had come out from that initial workshop, which I think is captured in a quote on the next slide that it shouldn't just be fine words because it leads into something meaningful on new models of care, the way that care is organised by providers in, in care markets and the workforce that's available, happy, aspirant to, to work in the care sector and having progressive options for career progression and, and job satisfaction in, in doing so. But that none of that means a thing if it isn't built around residents' wishes and people having the best day doing things they enjoy close to where they are with people they love. So you can read the sort of quote on the slide, but what we're going to do now is play a short film, which I think sets out some of the context for the quote and the ambition of our Care 2030. And, and after the film, Martin, Steph and Del in turn are going to take you through the sections on, on models, markets and workforce that hopefully the film, fingers crossed, it's, it's worked uh, well in the last rehearsal, um, but it'll get it across to you in a way that then Martin, Steph and Del can amplify through through a follow up in each section. So, Leah, do you want to have a go at queuing it up?
Well, I don't really know how to follow that. Uh, I feel like I've got the Duff card, uh, very inspiring and I think very positive sort of picture. I just want to take a couple of minutes just to run through, I think, many of the things that have already been highlighted in the film. So if we could just move on to the next slide. I think that one of the key issues for us is about developing ways in which we can support people and it's in the vision really about the life they want to live in the communities they're in and I think local government has been on a journey over the last period recognizing the importance of place and where people live is often more than the labels which we might have historically put on them. Okay on to the next slide. So you can whip through the slides quite quickly as you can see this is a uh, you'll be pleased to know is the final slide. We have been doing some work across the Northwest looking at uh, bringing people together to have a kind of step back together and think about what works well. I think what we are seeing is, as, the, as has been highlighted, the choices that people want, the way in which they want to have their friends and family around them. I think COVID highlighted, certainly for me, on a very personal basis with my own mother, the importance of for somebody with dementia of being able to maintain contact with their family. And I know there's a difference of opinions across directors and across local authorities and professionals, but certainly from my perspective, it was something about promoting how we maintain those relationships, which are more about their psychological well-being than their physical health have to be balanced. Um, but I think for us, it is about engaging in a whole range of different opportunities particularly around what communities can offer and seeing communities and engaging with them in a way to ask them how they want to be engaged but also what solutions they already have rather than us just deciding we have unfortunately got a bit of history at times of jumping to giving people what we already have and obviously to an extent doing it, that tends to lead you down doing two or doing four. And I think we're moving into a very different sphere. A lot of it, as has already been said, is how do we keep people out of some of the traditional system that could be out of hospital, but also out of reducing the numbers in residential care, supported accommodation and living. Uh, we've seen many benefits for that, um, particularly in people with learning disabilities. But I think it's something around mental health and around uh, older people that in many areas we're still um, using quite traditional services and need to be looking at how we can manage that. But have we also explored and exploited the use of technological change. We have seen certainly in the patch where I work, the NHS certainly recognizing the importance around digital enablement for people, but they still talk about uh, a telehealth approach, which doesn't for me do it because we need to be talking about assistive technology, which is much wider. Um, the focus really of the conversations that we've had and, uh, you know, obviously I'm sure that they've been going on in every locality, but the things that I would want to highlight really has been a, a system shift. And I think what Matt has set out in the earlier learning was actually bringing people together with a common aim and looking at whether the system actually is geared up to, to do what we want to do. I think it is then much uh, what we've described above is, is a shift in the model. Um, embedding discharge to assess, I think most of us are exploring ways in which we could keep that. Government certainly kept us uh, on tender hooks to see whether we were going to get uh, additional funding, but there's a way that we now need to look at as ADAS. How do we continue that into the longer term? But it's still the wrong solution for me. Getting people out of hospital quicker is really important, but actually, have we ever really exploited step up and what we could do to uh, to support avoidable admissions rather than just focus on step down, which has been the national preoccupation. I think linked to that, we've certainly been having the debate. You often hear the argument around prevention and early intervention. Where's the evidence that it works? Um, my director of public health is supporting me to have an argument with people to say, where's the evidence that it doesn't work? Because we've got plenty of evidence of the things that don't work, but we still put enormous amounts of money into them. Um, but I think that what we certainly want to be looking at is in our patch, there's an ongoing debate with our colleagues in the NHS about having an out of hospital cell, which was fine for a pandemic and a crisis. But when are we going to shift that into a community well-being approach? and stop being focused around hospitals and getting people out of beds. And I think certainly looking at a different range of people being involved in that, particularly linked to better information and advice. Are we absolutely clear that people get what they need early enough in the process to make informed decisions? Or do they wait till they're in crisis and then it's almost too late? 
digital transformation, I think, offers a great range of opportunities. And certainly one of the areas that I would link to on that was the experience we had locally of carers, many carers coming forward saying, actually, in COVID, we're getting more access to things than we did before, because I was never able to go to the carers centre or access some of the services because I was too busy caring. So this has made it much more accessible for me. Personalisation, I think, has certainly come to the fore. Uh, we certainly got day services that we're not seeing or likely to want to see to reopen because what we are seeing is many people choosing to do things differently, choosing to do things in their local community and doing things which I think will deliver more sustainable outcomes for them. So again, it's a, it's a shift in the model. I think the two um, other things that again have been touched on, and I think Matt referred to it before as opening a new door, but I think one of the things COVID has maybe been slightly more uncomfortable for us with is how many of us would have predicted that some of the places that would struggle most, both with COVID itself, but also vaccination would be the poorest communities. How many of us would have thought that it would be in those communities where people have the most communication problems? How many might have thought it might have been in things like the disabilities area, but also in, in, in the BAME communities? And I think that that gives us a bit of a challenge and an opportunity to think a bit about how do we engage or are we still using the same mechanisms to try and engage some people? And then at times they can even be referred to as hard to reach but actually it might be the mechanisms that we're using that we might need to consider doing differently so some really positive stuff that's come out of it and i think for many of us an opportunity to stand back and, and reflect on how we could make some of these changes more permanent okay i'll hand on to steph thank you martin um so i think I'm going to, I want to start with the, the, the point that Stuart made towards the end of his presentation, which was almost, um, so let's just step back to that, that event at Stockport and um, just think about what we were developing there in terms of our common sense of purpose, which um, gathered momentum, I have to say, during the pandemic. I think, you know, it was fantastic to be part of Team Northwest. Um, and, you know, and obviously I'm part of the, the Greater Manchester footprint as well, but I think, um, you know, it just showed really the strength in the partnership working, not just in the localities, but across the whole footprint, really. And uh, um, there was a real sense of pride in how everybody stepped up to really push, um, you know, this is social care, we're here, we're not going anywhere, you know. So, um, so I think, you know, that common sense of purpose we were already developing and we were able to put that into practice um, definitely as part of our response to the pandemic but moving on really uh, moving on now past the pandemic and, and you know extending that sense of common purpose beyond the pandemic um if we just move on to the next slide um so this this was really the this is what we came up with at our session at Stockport this was and it and it you know it speaks for itself really this was about we needed a we need to create that diverse and high quality market um we want to make sure thing, you know, that it's ethical, that we're investing in people, that we're investing in places, that we're building that community wealth and, and amongst everything else offers greater choice. Um, next slide, please. So um, in terms of just thinking about that kind of development of that term, we've put diverse and colourful market. Um, and I think that's a really good phrase because it kind of makes you feel like, oh, yeah, there's something really exciting about this. And, and how are we going to develop this together and, and build that excitement and the opportunity that we've got uh, in front of us? Um, we want to create these conditions that enables us to work with our providers, with all the other organisations and, and offer that kind of support. We're in a unique position, really, uh, for those of us that work in local authorities to be able to engage with a multitude of organisations that are that whole public sector, that whole public service response. It's not just about a kind of, um, a, a, you know, working with a, a health and social care response. We've got the wealth of all of that uh, in front of us. So just moving on to the bullet points, just thinking about that community wealth building, what we've been discussing um, uh, during the pandemic and, and obviously before was that that real feeling of how do we anchor care and support into the community and the neighbourhoods, whatever that neighbourhood is. And the neighbourhood might be, for me, it might be Hyde, which is one of our towns in Tameside. The neighbourhood might be Tameside. 
the neighbourhood might be Greater Manchester. The spatial level at the, it doesn't really matter, it's where it makes sense, but it's how do we anchor care and support into the community and thinking about the neighbourhoods? And how do we as, as commissioners, um, you know, grab that unique opportunity that I've just mentioned to build wealth in the community, to build resilience, and particularly to think about things like skills and jobs opportunities, and which obviously um, Delta will talk a little bit more about. And I just wanted to pick out there one of the um, phrases that Stuart mentioned, and he said there was pride in the flexibility of the workforce. So we were all really proud at how we were doing things differently. And that's a real opportunity, again, for us there to really build that pride into that, that community wealth that we want to build. In terms of the models of provision, um, you know, throughout the pandemic, um, you know, co-production and uh, cooperative working has been at the heart of all of our responses. You know, we've worked together to deliver different types of support to meet really unique circumstances. Um, and we mustn't lose that. And the other thing that we did, we did it fast. And we mustn't lose that as well. You know, that flexibility, that speed, that ability to really get underneath uh, the changes to the models of provision that we want to develop. Um, in terms of commissioning um, for the future, um, you know, we all know that local communities and neighbourhoods are usually and often the best place for people to get the support that they need to live life well. And it's crucial that we continue to use that commissioning capacity that we have to help people get what they want, what they need, what they sell help, say helps them to live at home. We've got some opportunities now that perhaps when we were sat in Stockport Town Hall, we didn't realise that we're coming our way, um, you know, because we have got a change in the market. We've got some flexibility because we've got some gaps in the market that mean we have to do things differently. So, you know, there's an opportunity there. I mean, we've said many times, you know, if, if you know, 12 months ago, well, probably not 12 months ago now, two years ago, you know, if, if I'd have sat down with my care home providers and said actually what I need is you to run at 80% capacity because I need to do something else with that 20% I'd have got laughed out of the room and actually you know we, that's where we are and we're, we've got that 20% capacity and this is not about putting those providers out of the market but this is about working with them to help them do something different with that capacity as well. Um, but it also includes building up that capacity and that capability in the local places. You know, let's spend some money with that cafe that does knitting or it does a book club um, and let's not call it a luncheon club. You know, and also building in how we think about the unpaid carers, because um, I think, you know, as Matt pointed out, and, and certainly the um, elected member commission, that, that work with the unpaid carers and, and the aftermath of that support is going to be crucial. Um, we talked about ethical businesses you know we want to work with providers with employers who are committed to building in our neighborhoods and um, delivering our ambition um, you know do these providers that we work with do they care and support for their work do they care and support their workforce do they contribute to the feel of the neighborhood are they developing a real social value um, aspect to their work and then finally um, from me you know now than ever we are seeing that that diversity in the market is creating more sustainability. There are lots of changes happening in the market, but that diversity gives us an opportunity to build um, a, a stronger market. Um, the market is responding uh, in imaginative ways. We've seen that, we've mentioned that lots already on the call, um, to co-produce support. And the pandemic has given us an opportunity really to develop that more diverse market. And we need to continue to take advantage of this. Um, as we move forward to delivering our 2030 vision. Uh, I think that's it from me. So I'm going to hand over to Del. Thank you, Steph. Um, I just would like to take a couple of minutes just to talk a little bit about how we were responding to some of our Northwest workforce challenges, but also how we intend to respond post COVID uh, also. So in the Northwest, we have a, a really clear vision for our workforce um, with a, an absolute focus on on care, on skills and on actual compassion to ensure that our residents are cared for and supported in, in the right way. Um, and we feel that there should be a real sense of pride in working in social care and we promote this at every opportunity. Uh, we're doing an enormous amount of work uh, across the region and we have a, a really active workforce forum um, and really good buy-in from a, a wide range of partners 
including Health Education England, all our ICS leads attend, uh, DASIS, uh, NHS colleagues, um, Skills for Care. So very active, very interested group of, of partners who help support our work across the Northwest. Thank you, next slide. Okay, so what are we actually doing? Well, part of our Care 2030 pledge is to make social care a career choice. That won't surprise any of you. Um, but what we're really promoting is uh, trying to ensure that there are clear and progressive career opportunities um, which are properly rewarded. Um, we want to make and move to one workforce which permeates across health and social care. And I think actually working through the pandemic has even heightened this further in terms of how we must achieve this in going forward. Um, and we're also looking at how we support the integration agenda and supporting the development of our three integrated care systems across the Northwest. So those new roles, those new integrated roles are at the fore of some of the work we're doing also. Um, just going through the bullet points, so starting with recruitment and retention, um, this has been a long-standing issue, it's a national issue, um, and in the Northwest we see incredibly high rates of attrition, um, and lots of difficulties around recruitment and selection, um, but also around retention in particular. Throughout the COVID pandemic response, we ran the Northwest Care Hero campaign um, on behalf of our providers, um, and it had great success. Um, we had 1,200 applications. Uh, we managed to give our providers a single point of access via the website and portal. Uh, we had a single Northwest brand to strengthen the potential of securing staff. Um, and that went down very well, and we'll look at how we continue that in going forward. We've also been quite proactive in working and starting to work with our local enterprise partnerships. Um, we have a few across the Northwest, and we're now linking in with their job fairs, um, working in conjunction with them around work zones, um, linking in around recruitment events um, and school events and uh, college events as well. We can't underestimate the economic value of, of social care. And as you saw from the previous film, um, that's to the tune of five billion across the Northwest. So it's really important to exploit that employability and that economic value. In terms of career pathways, um, in order to attract people into the sector, uh, we also need to provide a really good offer uh, and reasonable career pathways. We in the Northwest have developed a Career Academy Toolkit and we have several career developing career ac academies now across the Northwest. Uh, and we're also looking at trialing blended roles and some of this work starting to emerge particularly in Greater Manchester. In terms of our skills and values, uh, we're linking this work into our future models work that Martin was talking about previously in order to really identify those skill gaps um, and this year we'll be developing a capacity planning toolkit as well. Um, what we do need, what we do understand and, and what we do know is that we'll be looking at different workforce roles in, in going forward because we'll need to be able to respond to uh, varying and different need and the different ask of our resident population. Um, so that'll be at the forefront of our, our strategy. Just want to pick up on well-being. Um, I think it was uh, absolutely right that COVID highlighted this. Um, as being an important issue that we need to tackle uh, through our workforce uh, programme of work. Um, in the Northwest, we developed a directory of service, um, which listed a, a number of support um, organisations and support tools as well for our providers and for our care staff, which uh, landed very well indeed, and we'll continue to support that in going forward. We also um, developed a, a BAME risk toolkit uh, with providers and CQC, and we also set up a BAME advisory group to support this in going forward and that again will continue um, in terms of our future work. And finally, it's been mentioned throughout um, all of this, uh, all of the workshop today, uh, the role and the importance uh, of unpaid carers and how absolutely critical they've been in, in both our response, but in terms of going forward, in terms of that absolute support that needs to be out there in the community. And our absolute principle in going forward is, is treating our unpaid carers as we would treat our paid workforce. So whatever we try and achieve uh, in terms of our workforce strategy, we will in, be including unpaid carers uh, in parallel with that, um, recognising the absolute fantastic role that they've played throughout this. Um, so that's probably it in a nutshell in terms of some of the, the workforce uh, pieces of work. And I will hand back to Stuart. 
Thanks, Del. Uh, thanks, Steph, and thanks, Martin, for taking us through um, the workforce, the markets, and the models component of our Care 2030 sort of long-term vision. I'm not going to labour the, the kind of conclusion because we've got only a few minutes for kind of comments or reflections from the room, but I suppose a couple of points I would make is around a kind of um, a reaffirmation, really, of the things that are important and, and a sort of advert for self-determination of the social care sector and ourselves to set the tone and not to wait for the kind of hero coming over the hill because in a way like local systems and local people leading in systems are going to be the ones to make the difference and make the changes. I think that was really apparent to me in you know, what worked actually in trying to, you know, handle the, the COVID-19 kind of waves. And a lot of the time it was left to local people to make sense of things and further deepen and build relationships and trust, you know, between social care, health and communities. And there's a sense actually there's some things precious as well around kind of um, sector-led improvement and support at these times um, and kind of backing that and backing ourselves to help each other along and ADAS sort of sharpening its elbows and its voice on, on, on what's important for the long term as well as kind of, you know, building the, the rapid learning I think we've found through this last year into, into more permanent kind of um, um, innovations and breakthroughs for us. So I'm going I'm to stop there. As I say, not as um, not as well versed as Zoom and Teams on the kind of chat um, and uh, how we might marshal a discussion. I know quite a few comments have gone in the chat, and I don't know if Leah, you've managed to find a way to um, like bring comments through for us to to talk about, or if people who are on the the call want to indicate to come in with a question or a comment. Um, I think probably take. Uh, any comments if people have, but I think there were a couple of comments that I picked up from the chat that might be worth kind of looking at um, or, or responding to. So there was one reasonably early on from um, Linda Sanders, who uh, is a non-executive director of a housing association who was finding kind of this work really interesting. And I wondered if that might make quite a good opportunity just to elaborate a little bit more on the housing and that point from the video around people's homes matter and what that will mean for some of the different work streams. Thanks Leah, that's a good one. Delinda, do you want to come in and say anything? I don't want to pick on you if you're doing something else or uh, I think you've just come off mute, so. Yeah, I'm happy to. Hi and hi. Martin, that was a secret. All of your presentations are really good. I, th I was just doing a, um, a note. I thought they were thoughtful and grounded without there being a shred of being self-congratulatory, but what you've achieved has just been amazing. I can't imagine being an ex-director, just how tough it must have been in the last 18 months. So well done and thanks for the really thoughtful, reflective uh, presentations. Yeah, I'm um, a non-exec director. Uh, both for Children's Trust, um, but also for uh, Guinness um, Housing and Guinness Care, which, and we've got some presence in the Northwest. And I was interested in your comment about um, strengthening um, relationships with providers, because I always feel in a bit of an awkward, difficult position as an ex-DAS, but as a NED, I don't want to misuse or use inappropriately um, my sort of past history and position, but I sort of would rather quite like some engagement with um, directors, not only on one-off specific issues where things go awry, when I tend to be brought in and asked to, to occasionally, never in the Northwest, <laughs> but occasionally to talk to people. But I just, I'm just struggling on that sort of interface and just wondered how maybe um, providers like housing associations, not for profit, might be able to engage more effectively with you. Thanks, can I just start off and then see who wants to come in? I, I suppose like, from the point of view of having worked um, in local authorities in the main, sometimes with commissioning and provision in the same place, and then with NHS colleagues along the way with often a hard commissioner-provider separation. I've been convinced for a long time that 
co-production and collaboration is the way to create the right services, the right models. And we have to find ways for most of the time to be able to have those conversations together. And there's only the odd time when there's a, a very direct conflict of interest where the separation needs to occur. So just as a general comment, I know we've tried to pull the strategy together with providers, with users, just as strongly leading the way as, as people with commissioning responsibilities. And I think there'd be ongoing opportunities in the Northwest work where relevant for Guinness or whoever else to, to join in really, Linda. So that would just be a general comment, but I don't know if colleagues would want to come in with anything more specific. I think, uh, Stuart, uh, just to answer the particular element that Linda mentioned relating to a housing role, just as an example, a part of my portfolio also includes homelessness. Um, with our RPs over this period, we've uh, just done a video, which I will share with, the, with the, 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 our region, but we've rehoused into permanent tenancies with the RPs over a thousand people. Uh, which wouldn't have happened without COVID, which is a bit bizarre, isn't it? So, you know, we've seen some fantastic things happen, even though obviously we've seen some awful things as a consequence of COVID. So there's some real opportunities around that partnership work, because I think it is about as uh, co-producing as uh, I think Stuart's just said. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. Anything more on Linda's question from Steph or Dell or Matt? I suppose the other issue is just to reinforce, in my, my view, the importance of trying to encourage housing associations to stay in there in the market in terms of um, care, because I'm a net for Guinness Care as well as Guinness Housing. And um, so I'm passionate about extra care housing and have been for 15, 20 years. But um, equally, I think we've got a um, housing associations most major ones have come out of care because um, they were cross-subsidising um, local authorities um, in, in the provision and they just didn't feel that was justifiable or um, a good or an appropriate use of um, housing association funds. So I've been encouraging Guinness to hang on in there, even in those areas where we're in effect subsidising, not insignificantly for every care hour we provide. That's beginning in, in the last year or so, um, that's beginning to narrow, thankfully, and hopefully with some sort of new future settlement um, that might narrow further. But it's hard work trying to encourage, you know, um, well, housing association businesses to continue to cross subsidise an area that's um, draining resources that are already under pressure in terms of their development plans. Yeah, just as a general comeback on that, I, I know... Um... There's also the context of the understanding of place, isn't there, that local government brings so strongly. And then the potential risk on both the ICS developments and DHSC growing as a, as a sort of, um, you know, overseer of some of that and, and the continued connection of MHCLG and its sort of sense of future uh, affordable housing for general needs and specialist housing being a sort of permanent policy direction where we need reform. And I, I know ADAS is encouraging the sort of dialogue to, to be connected as best possible to understand the potential of housing actually as a, a central feature of new models. So sort of cold comfort on the day to day, but I think that the sense of just trying to put those stakes in the ground properly is, is definitely something that I'm in some of those conversations and, and no others are too. Did anybody else want to come in with any comments? Is something else in the chat or Leah, did you want to pick anything else out? I can see Neil's on and Neil's a, a passionate man on housing as, as I know. Do you want to come in with the comment you've put in the chat, Neil? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. So, yes, yeah, as, as, as you know, both the EDAS Housing Lead, but also the lead for the LGA CHIP programme on, on housing. So we have got discussions ongoing with DHSC and MHCLG. And like Linda, I'm also an executive director on the probably the largest, well, the largest extra care provider nationally, which is Housing 21. Um, so we're we're very keen to embed. And, and we've got quite a bit of a, well, with the doors more ajar than it's ever been with DHSC and MHCLG on embedding housing-based solutions in the social care reform. So I've dropped you an email separately to Stuart, because uh, I know how much you're involved in that. But, but on this call, it was just to say in that chat, as we're developing that with MHCLG, clearly they're asking about examples we can use, but how we can use that, not just as examples, but use the experience that we can embed in any sort of national programme. So it was interesting to see whether you think 
Um, and we're using COVID as, as a further example of, of why we need to get on with this sooner rather than sooner rather than later. I think some of the innovations you've talked about in the Northwest are fantastic. But as you know, we work within the constraints of the existing housing stock. And, and if we want to make a difference for 2030 and beyond, we need to, in, we need to get greater investment in, in how we change things. Thanks, Neil. Do people want to comment? Again, as a starter, I think we'd want to follow up with you on that because I th think we might be able to make a, a practical contribution to the evidence base or at least um, bear down on where we might not, where we might have gaps and, and, and plug them. But do, do people want to come back on that one? I mean, today, Stuart, and we've just um, uh, started a mapping exercise in the northwest. Um, hopefully, a fairly rapid one in terms of uh, not just housing; it's it's across all all models really. But where we're interested in models which um, kind of reflect our our ambition and aspiration in terms of future models and, and care twenty thirty, and part of that is um, housing models. So hopefully, we'll we'll get some you know um, evidence through that of, of what what that looks like, which could be used. Um, you know, regionally but also in, in national conversations as well so we'll be happy to share that uh, when we get it through great Stuart, thank can you I, can i just come in just, yep. just from a very local level i think now now's the time to start having that dialogue i know from a local level from my perspective we're developing an accommodation strategy so that we're in a position to respond to different need and a different ask um, from residents. So I think almost our extra care facilities, particularly, have sort of grown by osmosis without a really clear plan. Um, and what we're saying now is we need a really clear plan. We need that dialogue with providers um, to bring providers into the patch rather than it happening with providers contacting us. It needs to be that, that much better joined up approach. Um, but the, uh, certainly from a local perspective, we're knowing that that's our, our next step. Thanks. Thanks, Del. I'm going to, a mindful time's got away from us. So I wanted to do three thank yous if I could. I think the, the first one to all of you for joining us today. And if anybody wants to continue some dialogue with us on the Care 2030 work, we'd love to hear from you and, 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 and continue to, to talk and, and stay involved. So uh, via Matt and the team, please get in touch if there was stuff you wanted to discuss that we didn't manage today. A uh, second thank you to Martin, to Steph, to Dell, and to Matt um, for just um, the contributions and, 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 and being part of the, the speaking team today. And then finally, and, and maybe most importantly of all, to, to Leah and Christina and the ADAS team for just helping us put the, the day together. We had a, a bit of a fraught dress rehearsal yesterday where none of the IT worked properly, but it was smooth as silk today. And I, I really appreciate all the setup work and the support work that you put in place for us to, to deliver this, the seminar. Um, hope everybody enjoyed it and have a great rest of seminar and I really hope next year if the, we're going to go somewhere together and be able to actually do some face-to-face -face stuff as well as the benefits of digital. So I really look forward to next year's seminar too. Uh, thanks for joining today everyone.